far so good. It's looking like we're live. It says live. Ooh. Ooh. All right. So welcome everyone to Up Close. And today with Up Close, uh, I'm Randy Dixon, by the way, artistic director of Unexpected Productions. And today I'm going to be talking to uh, improv coach, teacher, performer, director, uh, man about town, and and dear old friend, Paul Kellum. But we'll get to Paul in a, in a moment. Um, and again, if you're watching this on Facebook and you have a question or a comment, please feel free to put it in the chat. I'll be trying to look at that. Uh, but sometimes it gets so caught up in the emotion of the talk that we're having that I forget to look, but we'll see what happens. Before also I get to Paul, a few announcements. As usual, again, we're doing shows. We're doing more and more shows as things carry on. So right now we're doing show live shows at the theater, uh, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And then we have an online show on Saturdays at 7. Oh, and I guess I should say the Wednesday show, 7 p.m., Sunday show, 7 p.m., Friday, Saturday, 8.30, and that's theater sports. Uh, Wednesday is duos, and Sunday is just an open improv format. Our online show is called UPTV, and that's at seven o'clock tonight on our Twitch channel. So be sure to check that out. Uh, we have some classes coming up, including a bunch of international classes in June, which is normally the time we host our international festival. So we're trying to celebrate that by having some international teachers come in and do some uh, workshops. They're all uh, ranging from actually a, a lecture from Yuri Kinagawa in, in Japan. So that's a one night, one day class to, I think the longest class is four weeks. But um, anyway, find out about all those classes and whatnot at unexpectedproductions.org, as well as uh, how to make a donation to our lovely organization to keep us going. Um, and hopefully things will keep moving forward and we'll be able to keep opening up and doing more shows. Um, so I'm not going to about that. So we'll see. <clears throat> see what happens and I'll give you some more plugs at the end of the, the end of this but I want to get to Paul Killam and uh, for those of you who were with us a few weeks ago I'm hoping this interview will go longer than uh, uh, three minutes or four minutes or however <laughs> although we were kind of done um, after four minutes it's like what else is there to say um, anyway but uh, so Paul's come graciously come back uh, and we're going to talk about the things we were going to talk about before and maybe some new stuff I don't know. So, Paul, welcome. Hi, Randy. <laughs> and uh, we're going to talk about different parts. Now, for those of you also in uh, improv land uh, who are not familiar with Paul, Paul uh, was doing improv up here with Unexpected Productions in the early days. We're going to spend part of the time talking about his experience there. And he's been instrumental uh, in as a, a member of BATS Impro and... Uh, and we'll talk about that, maybe the differences and distinctions or the adventure that he's had. So yeah, there it is right there. So, so and they do theater sports. So now you can view the other one. There you go. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I'm get some improv teaching because Paul also teaches um, at, in at colleges, things like that, like a real professor. Um, and uh, anyway, I want to get to it. So uh, if you've seen these before, Paul, which I believe you have, um, I usually start with just sort of how did improv find you? Um, and how did it call you? Was it a show you saw? Was it something you always thought about doing? Um, and also, what was that first experience like? Well, gee, how did it find me? Um... Well, I was lucky enough. I grew up in uh, Davis, California, which is a college town in, in the Central Valley near Sacramento. And uh, there was an English teacher who was uh, one of those uh, kind of teachers who kind of changes everybody's lives around them. Uh, his name is Dave Burmester. He's still around. I, he, I think he retired. Nah, he retired some years ago because uh, obviously he's much older than I am. Uh, but uh, he, he went to San Francisco State uh, for his teaching degree. And when he was teaching, uh, the committee was on, uh, on Columbus Avenue in, not Columbus, on Broadway in San Francisco. And they had a long running uh, improvisation show 
They, as a matter of fact, they were the originators of the Herald uh, way back in the day. And uh, they, uh, so he went to the committee as, as a young man getting his teaching degree and he loved it. And I think he took, I'm sure he took workshops and that sort of thing. And when he was teaching high school at, uh, at Davis Senior High at the time, uh, he started in an improv group. And I remember uh, my friends in, the, in the, the music department, in the drama department, well, department in the drama area <laughs> of school. The drama uh, room. Right. Yeah. <laughs> They all, uh, uh, they all were doing it, and I went and saw one of their shows, and you know, it, was, it freaked me right out. And uh, all these folks were saying, "Oh, you'd be good at this. You like Monty Python, you, you know, you're an in, you like Saturday Night Live, you love that stuff." It's like, yeah. And so they they got me involved in it, and uh, and as, after I did it in high school, I found it uh, it was not exactly traumatizing, but. Everybody else was so interesting and clever and and wonderful and came up with stuff and I was uh, I didn't think I was doing anything and uh, Dave uh, Burmester was very uh, like you're doing the right thing this is exactly what's needed and I thought that's great and eventually uh, when I went off to college and stuff like that I started doing theater in college and one of my last years of college uh, a director by the name of Bill Gaskill came over from. Uh, from England and he uh, one semester didn't have uh, wasn't directing a, a show so all the undergraduates we were pretty active we said we want something from him and so he took he directed an impro class and he was friends with with Keith Johnstone at the Royal well, Court, Court. Theater. yeah, yeah. Royal Court. and uh, he was one of those guys and he he <clears throat> knew impro and suggested that we look at impro and uh, like any college student, I didn't pay any attention to him, and I didn't, I didn't read the book. But one of my uh, one of my colleagues read it and said, "Oh, you got to read this, Paul. It's fantastic. It's a great book." And so I checked it out of the uh, college library, and I was uh, I was going to summer theater. I was working a, a tech in in summer theater one summer, and as I uh, rode the bus from Davis to the summer theater, I read this thing, and it was so so hilariously spot on about everything that I was laughing really loud and everyone on the bus would go and look over the shoulder. It was wonderful. And it, you know, and that was kind of the beginning of it. And then, uh, you know, going off to be a, a real actor person, uh, Sherry Galpert, mm -hmm. who's a, shout out to Sherry. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, she was directing a play that my roommate and I auditioned for, and we were hitting on her, I believe and being funny and she said to us when we came out hey you should check out this thing theater sports that we do and then it all went from there right right cool yeah right and that's how that's how i got involved that at, at i went to a show at the pioneer square theater late at night and uh the love handlers were playing and it was i think it was <laughs> i think it was three of you that night and you were playing against a team of probably seven it seemed like and you guys crushed them and i i know it's it's i know that it's not really competitive and you guys were on it and they were not wow. and and you know the, the crowd was mad and i mean not mad angry they were going crazy and right. i thought wow okay yeah uh sherry was right this is great and the next day i went to ross hall and took a workshop wow yeah yeah so again, a little history there. Love Handlers was a long lasting team. I think we played for a year straight and it was when we were doing King of the Hill. So the winner would always come back. And it was uh, myself, Josh Konisky, who's now in Newton, Massachusetts and Floyd Van Busker, who's in Los Angeles. And we just kind of kept going and it kind of took on a life of its own. Um, Sherry, by the way, is also in, in Newton, Mass. Oh yeah, really? Wow. Yeah. yeah. Wow. I wonder if her and Josh have gotten together or talked to her. Uh, I want to say yes, because we've had dinner with uh, Sherry uh, over the years, right. in the, before in the before times. So, yeah. Right. Okay. Now, tech thing, I'm going to press a button, which might create an echo. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. There we go. Now we're good. Cool. <laughs> we're, we're all gold. 
So uh, you went to Ross Hall and Ross Hall was where we were doing, I mean, again, in those days, there, you know, we didn't really have a school. We didn't really, you know, there were hardly any books. And so we were meeting basically on weekends at Ross Hall, which was the union hall. Um, and how did that, I was always curious about how that wound up because that must, somebody must have, like their, their uh, family must have been part of a union or something. Yeah, uh, it was through, I believe, Rich Hawkins, who's now on a, a board uh, and also back uh, performing. He was working with the union, and so he got um, access to uh, to Ross Hall, which at some point it stopped being the union hall, and they tore it down, and, they, and there's a house there now. So um, yeah, it was, It's a, on the border of, like, Fremont and Ballard, right? Yeah. 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 I mean, it was, it was a kind of weird place to have this, like, union workspace, but... Uh, sure. Uh, house fits in a little bit better because it's a residential neighborhood. So uh, what were your impressions then when you first started taking those classes? Well, it was uh, it was marvelous because it was uh, rehearsals, I guess, when there yeah. weren't any classes. Right? <laughs> no, no, these were classes. There were it was the thing where at intermission, the, the MC said, you might be thinking to yourself that you can that I could do oh, that. Right. Okay. It's true. And we do classes. And so I went went up there the the. The next day I paid my paid my money. It was pretty cheap at the time. And uh and I was in class. And the here's the here's the thing about about theater sports. I will forever be grateful to theater sports for this. Is I was uh I moved to Seattle after college to do actor stuff. And uh I was doing auditions, and I could feel them getting worse and worse and worse because I hadn't been on stage in you know, it would be like months and months and months. And I could feel, you know, all the rust building up on it. I wasn't connecting with, you know, the uh, Pioneer Square Theater, the dude sitting in the back eating sandwiches while you're trying to do your work. Yeah, it was that kind of stuff. And uh, no offense, Pioneer Square Theater, I would have done the same thing. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I I went, I was, they were going badly. I, uh, I, took a class and the very next audition, the one I had on the Monday after the, after the Sunday, uh, I got a touring Shakespeare thing. And I went off on tour uh, uh, to the San Juan Islands for a summer, you know? Wow. And it was like, oh, great. Hey, this is what you do. And then, then actually uh, Steve Gredley and Rebecca Stockley knew people in the cast and came up and saw the show. And Rebecca came up to me backstage afterwards and said, hey, you're coming back, aren't you? And I had no, I didn't even know if I was going back to Seattle, but I went, oh, they, yeah, sure, I guess. And so it kind of gave me, it kind of gave me a career. Right. So kind right. of, it did, it did. <laughs> you know, so, yeah. Right. We'll send you a bill. Uh, uh, well, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm glad to pay. Right. Um, for some reason, a memory that pops in my head, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, because it might be my imagination, but one of the first things I remember before kind of even getting to know you was you were this like really tall guy who wore really cool sweaters. You had yep. these really cool knit button-up sweaters, and I was just like, wow, that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> it, that's absolutely true. And uh, the, first, the first show I ever did was I did... Uh, the very first improvathon at the uh, the Glenn Hughes Playhouse, I want to say. Playhouse, yeah. Uh, and uh, I was wearing one of my cool sweaters, <laughs> and uh, and it, uh, it was great. I actually got on not in the not at three in the morning. I got on at probably uh, it was like ten thirty or something like that. So it was a pretty full house, and it went really well, and all this sort of stuff. And Rebecca told me afterwards, years later, that. Uh, that while I was on stage, a bunch of the uh, the the Brahmins of theater sports were in the back of the house going, hey, who's that guy? And somebody goes, well, I think he's from Canada. <laughs> Obviously the cool sweater means Canada. So, yeah. Right. Yeah, they're, yeah. In fact, yeah, in, same here in Seattle, in our hallway going into the theater is a poster from that in Providence. Oh yeah, so it was like a big clock, and then the yeah. the Shakespeare head thing. Yeah, yeah. And uh, huh. so, uh, as you're getting your feet wet in Seattle doing improv, uh, <clears throat> what were the impulses that you had in terms of like what did you feel like were big mistakes that you, in hindsight, 
that you made, like, oh, I didn't pay enough attention to this, or I paid too much attention, you know, to this? Um, well, I think the biggest uh, the biggest lesson was uh, that being a, a young uh, man in theater, I, I was pretty sure that I knew everything. So, on some level, the biggest uh, the biggest issue I think was learning that. Uh, just because I think something is is true is is I'm probably not correct in that sort of thing. So I should pay attention and understand why I say these things. Because I remember uh, when I first started doing uh, when we, like I was I did a reg I was doing the regular show in Swanee's Comedy Underground, mm -hmm. and uh, it used to be that one offer would make me feel terrible for a week. You know I'd be going to my job on the bus going, oh man, why did I say this? What is wrong with me? And then, uh, you know, after a few months of doing, of regularly playing, it was like one scene would be the same way. It's all week. Oh God, <laughs> what are you doing? And then after another six months or so, it was like one show would maybe go, I, I'm, I suck. I can't do this. I don't know why I'm doing this. And then after a while, I started going, Wow, I haven't really done anything interesting in a month. <laughs> so it was one of those things where you adjust, you adjust to it's a process, and I don't really know what I'm talking about a great deal of the time, and uh, uh, I can guess at things, but I, you know, right. So it was it was a sense of ego was if I could get rid of the ego and understand that a great deal of the problems that most improvisers have have to do with fear. So. You, once you start understanding that you're likely to be afraid and there's a bunch of stuff that will constantly make you afraid. Right. And once you get past that, it's, it's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting in those days. I think when you were first getting involved, we were still in that kind of, and I don't even know how, how we managed to survive because it was the, you know, there was no resources. No. You know? And it wasn't until, I mean, we really, uh, I mean, grounded ourselves in, in Keith and Keith was coming down he kind of gave us um a little bit of fatherly direction I guess um but until then I'm just kind of going there how did we figure it out it's like you know because we would just show I remember showing up at those workshops at Swanee's uh, before the show and nobody yeah, yeah, yeah. nobody knew what to do <laughs> It's like, well, let's play some games. Okay, great. And, you know, but there was no real feedback or anything. It was like, um, at least the, you had the presence of mind. Well, you, I, I point at you, but yeah. at least uh, the, the, the folks at theater sports had the presence of mind to have somebody in charge of it rather than just sort of a jammy free for all -y thing. Right. I'm sure there are great fun jammy free for all kind of things out there, <laughs> but having somebody to at least go next, we're going to do this is right. very important because i know uh, i know just after college just after college or was i in college i don't remember exactly but i was doing some improv with some uh people that i had been involved in theater in high school and college with and we were doing improv and we would just come to, uh, on like tuesday nights to this place and we would fart around for two hours and it was nobody was saying what comes next or even what comes next like we're all gonna dance like maybe we didn't even do that we i have no it didn't work because we couldn't we weren't organized and we were all going off in different directions right so right yeah yeah i'm not again it was in a way in hindsight it was a bit magical in the sense that somehow we i was saying to somebody last night after a show that you know um and I firmly believe this, then I go, wow, you know, this, this company is very strong um, because it has survived all our best efforts to kill it. Uh, <laughs> you know, just because we didn't know what was going on or we made just, you know, uh, but somehow the company just kind of kept going. And it's, um, it's, it's also nice when, uh, when people let go, because there's, uh, I know that, uh, <clears throat> that when just uh, when I was first starting out, uh, actually becoming an, somebody who had an opinion that was valued at, at Seattle Theater Sports, that we would have meetings and stuff like that where people would get pretty heated about all sorts of stuff. And uh, once 
you know, and, and when I moved to San Francisco, we would have, it was very much a collective kind of thing when we first got here to San Francisco. And we, uh, it's not that we fought a lot, but, uh, it, you know, there were, people had really strong opinions and were sure of themselves and would get themselves into positions when, you know, that sort of thing. And it would, right. uh, that, that any improv company survives more than, uh, more than a couple of years is, uh, I is shocking. And, right. and I think the natural order of it really on some level is that you will, you will not do it at relatively soon. They shouldn't last because there's everybody is creative and has ideas and wants to explore them. And it's very difficult to, to get on, to have some sort of organization that, that proceeds on once, once uh, you don't get your way and you have to let the organization do its own thing and see if you can be a part of it. And most of the time you can't, and that's okay. Right. Well, and a lot of the time I'm talking about those early days of, I mean, and more around the business more so than the, the work itself, but you know, I remember those group meetings where we were still trying to be democracy. And, uh, <laughs> but, you know, people challenging each other to fist fights over. So I was just like, is this really how we want to run things? Yeah. Yeah. It is, it is an improv show. Guys. It's supposed to be fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah the, the, the confrontations, the silly confrontations, I think. Yeah. I guess that kind of makes it uh, better later, but. <laughs> yeah. Well, and what you're saying about <clears throat> the lifespan of an improv group. I mean, I remember once I had this conversation with uh, um, actually Keith Johnstone about just how, you know, the, the, the road of improv is just, you know, lined with the corpses of friendships on either side. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, because people people can't get along people fight people break up you know and, and in fact that's how we kind of ended up um with the original company right because we had all the remnants of these other groups and everyone kind of clung together and all of a sudden we had hey we've got a company here let's let's keep going um yeah yeah so. <laughs> and it's 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 weird because you know i think i don't know why uh there's this thing that people have where they they think that it has to be something that goes on for years and years and years and there's some version of huge disappointment if you don't have that go on, but not theater companies don't last forever. You know, right. they just don't uh, unless, and, and even it's not even unless it's like second city is not really a theater company. It's a business that has a theater company that they right. do stuff with, you know, it's a, it's a bar really. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and that takes on a life of its own in terms yeah. of what they have to do with the work there and, yeah, we'll come, we'll come back to that, but I want to stay in Seattle for just a moment, um, which is other favorite projects or shows that you did. For instance, for me, I was thinking about this this morning, one of my favorite things uh, was you were in one of the first Christmas carols, improvised Christmas carols that we did, and doing uh, uh, Elvis, and you sang Blue Christmas. That's and, right. <laughs> I, I had on a, 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 white, a white linen thing. I forget there was a bu a bunch of uh there was some costume depository in Seattle right. that sold off all their stuff and there were a bunch of these white jackets and a, a lot of us got white lit jackets and and I think uh some I think it might have been Rebecca sewed gold lame on the lapels and I, I had that for the longest time wow and and you know I, I came from the the back of the group theater <laughs> right. walking through the audience singing blue christmas yeah yeah. I don't remember that. It was pretty exciting, <laughs> I'd say. And for you, are there favorite moments or shows in particular that you kind of go, oh, that show was great? Or I, and it can also be a, the train wreck shows because there were a lot of those too. Oh, geez, uh, yes. <laughs> oh, geez, yes. Well, uh, when uh, I remember there was, uh, there was some, we, I was on several long running teams, several of them with you. My first team was, was with you. Uh, and we went on for a very long time at the uh, at Swanee's Comedy Underground. But uh, I can remember there was uh, there was uh, there was a particular. Uh, I remember there was a set at the group that was fantastic. It was a uh, I think it was for Curse of the Spider Woman, and it had these giant uh, uh, 
cell block walls that went up and it was uh, it was kind of impressionistic like um the cabinet of dr caligari or something <laughs> and really you know win windows up up high and they're sort of askew and stuff like that there's a giant door and the, the giant cell door and stuff like that and and there was there were like things in front and i remember we were there was some we had a the the the, the barrels full of props and they were they were behind these things and there was some sort of a i want to say a shakespearean kind of thing but it was like a you know swords kind of thing going on out front and i was looking around for something to bring onto the stage and i saw these pot lids and uh it, i i, I want to say it was keith dahlgren and maybe bob kramer or somebody like that uh, challenging each other uh, as as people as people do in with swords and and i'm and i look at him and i look at the pot lids and i go oh and i lean out from behind the thing and i'm going fight fight you know and they're just talking mostly i'm going fight and they, they finally get the swords out and i start clanging the pot lids together oh great and it was one of those things where as soon as they went like that they went clang they said you could see their eyes get really big and the audience just went wah because it was this thing that suddenly changed the the uh the experience for the audience it, it added in another layer of reality to the thing and then they they clanged around for a bit and yeah i don't remember what happened or anything like that but it was that <laughs> little moment thing uh, so that was a, a, one of those things where you sort of go, you can do anything with anything. And if it changes the perspective, the audience will love you for it. Uh, I remember I remember that some kid saw uh, one of our one of the teams that you and I were on and wanted to bring us to his high school on the other side of the of Lake Washington, you know, and we go, OK, well, and somebody I you probably negotiated something with them as far as money goes. And we go to the we go to the high school and it's a big gymnasium kind of thing. And we show up there and it's like four nerd kids and their parents and they're getting ready for stuff. And we go and it's like uh, 730 or something like that. And we're going, you guys are selling tickets, right? Yeah, yeah, we're, we're selling tickets and all that sort of thing. Right. Quarter of eight. So yeah, you, know, you did. You advertised it and everything, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah we did. Eight o'clock rolls around, and there's absolutely nobody there. Absolutely nobody. And we're like, uh, okay, all right. Uh, this is this is one of those things uh, that right, right, right. that uh, you know we may think we're famous as all hell, but we in fact are not and uh and we have we went along with these these and i remember the debt the dad or somebody offered us money and we went you know yeah don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah i remember that yeah very humbling experience I was yeah it was, it was quite humbling and one of those things we gotta remember remember what you're doing here we're doing you know right, right. you know yeah. And then, unfortunately, not isolated either. <laughs> oh, no, no, but that was a it, the first big, like, empty one was one of those ones. Was like, okay, yeah. But I remember stuff like uh, uh, we tried uh, going, we tried doing a, sh a show at Scoundrels Layers on Wednesdays. Right. It was very close to the group where we were doing great business. And most of the time, it was five improvisers, three judges, and the bartender. Right. And that was it. And we would ask for suggestions from the bartender, and he would go like this. <laughs> right. Do we have a place where two people might meet? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, we so were very what? itinerant, and we played in any dump that would have us. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, yeah, we were doing all the scoundrels there. We did. Yeah. Oh my God. We performed in pretty much every theater in town. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, at, I guess the ones that that I was uh, that I was part of was it was mostly uh, uh, Swanee's County Underground and uh, and the group theater. And then there were some other ones like when the group had some big set that they didn't want us touching. We would, you know, go. We would play at Seattle Pacific in one of their multi-purpose rooms or or whatever. Right. But I also and I also remember that every now and again at Swanee's, uh, we would get a uh, 
a table of drunken swabbies who came down to heckle comics. Right. And at intermission, we'd go down and go, guys, it's lovely to have you here. Here's your money back now. Please leave. <laughs> right. Because the other three people want to enjoy the show. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Exactly. Right. So, oh, yeah, there were there were there were times when uh, I remember people getting on stage basically wanting to fight like you're not funny and they would get on stage and it would be like trying to talk them talk them down yeah um, yeah, yeah. It, was, it was it was pretty crazy yeah um i think i mostly remember a lot of the stuff that was like peripheral to the actual shows you know? right yeah yeah i mean that that's true too i mean there are a number of shows uh a few shows i remember there was a lot of stuff that i remember about the show not the show itself yeah um, so uh so uh when did you guys and um uh, you and rebecca became an item yes we did and uh, still are an item we're uh, married <laughs> yeah so there we go um and um when did you guys move to san francisco uh, we moved in the in uh, I think uh, either I think it was March of eighty nine. Of eighty nine, wow. Okay. It was a, a what I remember is there were a couple of snowstorms that year, and the last one was two days before we uh, we moved, and it was like, are we going to get trapped in Seattle? Are we going? we we can't drive the goddamn U-Haul in the snow. We just can't. Yeah. Yeah. And Seattle luckily, won't let you leave. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So it's spring of '89 because we moved. We moved in '89 and just in time to uh, move into an apartment and have the earthquake in 1989. So, oh right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So yeah. in terms of you know with with bats and the beginning of bats and being around the formative time of, of bats, what did you find most valuable from your days in Seattle that you found applied? to as bats was sort of taking shape and form uh wow uh what was the most valuable uh just the well the the thing that i found probably the most valuable is that uh uh because of the uh, because of constantly working uh when we were in seattle uh, i was on stage at least one time once a week and usually two sometimes three with theater sports and our and our main show was like Swanee's and then we had one night at, at the group and then two nights at the group so sometimes it would be three nights a week where you're working all you're working all the time and you're doing all you're just going through scenes right uh that you uh, that was the thing I found most it was just the work you have you need to work and you need to go on and the, the whole right. idea of um at least uh, and it's not a, a particular negative, but it was like specifically noting the difference between the the, the two organizations and the way people ap approach things. Uh, uh, knowing, okay, when we were in Seattle, we did tend to fall into roles. And it's not like you're always the waiter and you're always the princess or whatever the thing is. It was uh, like there would be someone who, uh, who could do narrative and somebody who could do characters and somebody who was a, a finisher and somebody who could make the scenes glue together. Mm -hmm. and, the, and there was a bit of there was a bit of that. I know that when I first started, I remember having conversations with Andrew Hamoudi where mm -hmm. he was talking about why certain teams worked and didn't. While when we moved to Seattle, uh, there was a specifically conscious thing where you would get called out for uh, for taking on the same role over and over again or the same, not role, but you know, the same function in an improv right. team. So right. it was understanding that you can do both of the things and it's, it's just a matter of understanding where it is that you're playing and what kind of uh, style you're trying to play. Right. And then in terms of timing, and this is more, again, history stuff, and then we'll get into the nuts and bolts of the work. But uh, so from the time, mm -hmm when you got involved with bats and bats was was starting how long of a period do you feel until you felt like it, it was established um as a, where you felt comfortable like okay it's not going to go away two weeks from now because i remember in seattle we felt that for a long time of like 
how much longer can we do this? <laughs> you know, will they let us do it? <laughs> well, uh, when we when we came to Seattle, it was a going thing. We it was itinerant, but we they had rented a uh, rented a spot in a in an old uh, um, Sears in the old Sears building that had hardwood floors and high ceilings, and we'd run all our workshops out of it. But we were going to different uh different uh places to to perform all around town and i think when i was sure was when we came back after the earthquake because the um the place that we were playing we used to play only on monday nights uh but when uh, when we came back from from uh the 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 building that we were in uh was condemned uh the sh the, the theater we were in was condemned and had to be rebuilt, uh, and it, that took you know six years or something like that. But when we had to leave there, and we went on to the next place uh, that was, we foolishly took on a lease where we couldn't we couldn't break even, and and it was one of those things. Like, well, it wasn't even a lease. We foolishly rented out spot like a night from a, a different theater, and it was it was crazy. We couldn't we would we couldn't actually get enough people in the building to break even and after we got to a place where we could it was like oh i see there is enough momentum and people do care enough about how this works where we can actually do it and it was probably i would say it was within a year after the earthquake so it would have been like a, a couple of years after we moved to seattle but it was it was already going pretty well right right yeah. um Cool. And there was a, a sort of thriving, I think, at that time, uh, or interesting, if nothing else, if not thriving, improv scene in San Francisco. So there were a lot of things going on. And eventually, you know, <laughs> uh, for, a for a long time, there was it was there was the remnants of uh, of the committee called right. uh, what was it? National Theater of the Deranged. And they had sort of moved toward more towards sketch with some improv. And they were they were around for a very long time. And there was also Flash Family, which was right. But, you know, there would be groups that sort of pop up and then disappear and pop up and disappear and, you know, little right. things going here and there. So I think the the theater sports thing was after a significant number of improv groups had had been flourishing in San Francisco and then then disappeared. Right. So it, I think theater sports became a thing in response to other groups not maintaining a, a lasting presence, really. Right. right. So yeah. So by default, it kind of took over the picked up yeah. the audience, whatever audience there was. Yeah, and it, and it has to do with the the ability of understanding that it's story first, and you need to make you, it, and if you can make stories happen for three minutes at a time, over and over and over again. Uh, with different people coming on stage one after another, the theater sports model, uh, you know, it had it had a certain vitality where you could bring where people would be interested in coming to the theater for the idea of sports and then get something different in, right. out of the other end of it. So right, and I want to run with that a little bit since you brought it up. Um, the first part is the second thing that you said, which is that to me was the beauty of theater sports is people didn't understand improv because it wasn't on TV. There weren't a million books. There weren't all this stuff. So you tried to explain it to people and they're like, what, you know, yeah, yeah. why would I do that? Um, yeah. And, uh, but they got sports. Oh, two teams. And there's a winner and a loser. Oh, got it. <laughs> yeah. You know? And so it gave this great structure to, uh, to the, the games uh, and scenes. Um, and then the first part of what you said about story because that was one of the things i wanted to talk about because what i find interesting in the so-called west coast tradition of improv is such an emphasis on story over um, other stuff and i mean it's not entirely true obviously of a group like the groundlings and things like it on the west coast in la that tend to focus on character but i'm curious to hear your thoughts in terms of why is story in a way job one uh, from from my uh, from my taste, mind you, it's just my taste. Mm -hmm. I, I think that that's uh, that's the that's the thing that that makes the the enterprise of theater go 
of course we like to see uh, uh, handsome and beautiful people speaking well and being able to uh, to to make the words sing and all that sort of stuff. Uh, we love that's a great a great thing. The idea of watching a performer, love it. Uh, however, the thing I think that makes it last is story. I mean, that's why why people still are interested in seeing Hamlet. Not everybody is, but Hamlet exists because it's got this story that addresses hum the human condition or uh, the Oresteia, for God's sakes, or you know any of the any older plays, it speaks to something about the human condition. Right. And this, what happens with story is if you can tell story, uh, people take it away from the theater with them, in my opinion. So right. you don't you don't just go, oh, wasn't that cool to see? I can't think of an actor right now. <laughs> Peter, o it was wasn't it great to see Peter O'Toole shouting his head off? You know, <laughs> uh, my favorite actor, by the way, the late okay. great Peter O'Toole. But uh, it was you, it's great to see that kind of stuff. Sure, but if you're just going, oh, was it? If you go and you're watching a performance, in my opinion, you sort of go, oh, wasn't that great? What's next? But right. if, you, if you've had something where you've gone through a story and you've experienced the story, it's like reading a book where, uh, where we, we start reading uh, these symbols on a piece of paper and all of a sudden we start hallucinating wildly and projecting ourselves into the, uh, into the characters and what would I do? How would I feel? What would happen to me if uh, you know, orcs started coming out of a cave near my house? What would I do? You know, you, you project yourself into that and you start to you start to have those feelings and those sort of things. And every time there's a successful bit of theater, it causes slight uh, revolutions. I like to think of it. So it's a there, it's not like, uh, you know, lining everybody up against the wall who's in the ruling class and shooting them all. But there's these revolutions of the mind where you. Uh, you ch you get changed by things. You suddenly consider uh, what it means to think to be or not to be. That is the question, and of course, that's that is the question of of human existence. Well, why do we have those sort of things? And if you have that thing where you get to watch somebody else do it and project yourself into it, and in the context of a story that looks like what life is and or looks uh, and has been shaped into something where we can imagine ourselves in it i think it it makes you want more of it and it makes you consider things about your life and that's 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 the thing i think you know right. well and it's also interesting i think uh, picking up on a couple of things that you said you know like the the notion of hamlet so you go see multiple productions of hamlet you're not expecting a different ending right you know, right. Like, you know. Well, you're hoping <laughs> but what you're looking for is the performance the execution set design all the rest of that stuff and uh, and that has a sort of uh, resonance within us i think emotionally and that's you know that and the way i talk about it is it, it's you know our, our scene work should be more about expansion and not so much about advancing it's not about the plot it's not about let's have some complicated offers the complicated plot it's more like what does it mean to the people involved and when we can do that and uh and actually rebecca commented on that you know improvised stories spontaneously and collaboratively in real time if we do that and then there's a story there it is it's like watching a magician it's like how did they do that right how did they move me um you know why, why do i care right there is part of that the, the magician uh right. the magician idea i i, I get that but for me, it's it's more of a, a thing where it's the stuff that that they don't you don't think about how did that group and that actor and those people do this to me? It just becomes part of you, right? And it's just a it's just a semantic argument, I guess, because you know, just is. <laughs> I've I've really noticed that as I've gotten uh, as I've gotten more mature. Uh, I can go and see a play that uh, is not very good. And if they tell a story and they commit to the story and they have a point of view, I get something out of it. And, uh, and I found that, you know, like I relatively recently, uh, 
I went to a, a production of Romeo and Juliet in Ashland that I did not find very good at all. I, I thought that Romeo and Juliet did not mix well. I thought they did something really stupid at the beginning that it okay. kind of took me out of it. It just wasn't working. And at the end, the ending was good and they stuck with the story and they and the ending fit with the rest of the story. And I, I found tears streaming down my face. It was like, good God, oh, look at that. They turned the they've turned the empathy machine on and and I feel sad and wonderful and released and and all that sort of stuff. Uh, you right. know, it's that thing where we want to go through that process. We want to have that feeling. We want to uh, we we want to know what it is to have those things. And right. Yeah. Um, so and expanding a little bit more and pulling in your um, your work with college students now you're standing in front of a class, uh, teaching a bunch of students who aren't paying attention to you. Uh, <laughs> and uh, as you said. <laughs> perfectly, uh, <laughs> perfectly reasonable. It's a reasonable <laughs> thing, I gotta say. So, and, but also in, in working with improvisers and teaching improvisers or directing improvisers. Um, you know, I've had a lot of discussions recently about at some point the students have to expose themselves and do the work. And, uh, and so I'm wondering what, what kinds of avenues you tend to send your students or actors kind of go, hey, you know, like you were talking about uh, Alien being your favorite movie. So maybe it's just, hey, I know you're young or whatever, but watch this movie and then we'll talk about it uh, related to the story. Are there, are there things that you are kind of go-to bridges um, to kind of make the connection to story? Not necessarily explain story, but just ways to get them uh, activated, motivated. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. I, I tend to I tend to point people in the direction of of movies, and uh, kind of my go to movies tend to be uh, uh, three or four Kurosawa movies. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know that's pretty pretentious, but hey, I'm a pretentious guy. <laughs> uh, but you know, it's things like uh, there's there's three or four movies uh, that Akira Kurosawa uh, directed where you can say, well, look at the visual storytelling for this and look at how this works. And uh, you have these choices and it, you go and you see them. Uh, I, re I recommend you do them. And most of the time, I know they're not going to go and they're not going to look at it. They don't have the time. They don't the, they don't have the availability reading a movie is not everyone's first choice certainly it's not mine either but you know it's things like if they see it and they can attach image and story and uh and emotion all together they 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 get something out of the way you tell a story Rashomon is a is a particular favorite because of the way it looks it looks at story Right, and you can start a conversation with people if they've seen Rashomon. You can talk about stuff like the Usual Suspects and uh, Pulp Fiction, and uh, I, you know, those are the those are the two other ones that come to mind because I'm old and I don't really remember any of the newer ones that do that. But <laughs> right. That thing where they there's a looping storytelling narrative that happens where you. You, if you pay attention, you're rewarded, right. and then you start thinking about all the different lines of communication that go off in that way. So, right. And, you know, I mean, the, the movies that you're mentioning there, I mean, super complex in terms of trying to improvise something like that. Oh, um, God, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because at every turn, there's, there's you know, a derailment that could happen because somebody doesn't get an offer, somebody doesn't understand where it is in the context of the story. The fingerprint of storytelling is interesting as well because you're know, talking about Kurosawa. So I was thinking um, the elements of his storytelling, um, I think, are, are pretty amazing. And he sort of has a style and he definitely has sort of uh, types of movies that he makes. And that's one of the reasons why I love watching um, High and Low. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, that's a good one. Because it's not a traditional Kurosawa movie in terms of, you know, the, the period and the way it is but it has no, so all no swords yeah no yeah swords. but it has all the elements of a kurosawa movie you know, uh, so uh, ikiru it. ikiru is another one of those yeah. ones like that where it's like yeah, mm. yeah. So, that one that one haunts me 
Yeah, uh, it's been sitting kind of near the top of the pile to rewatch for a while. So you're, you're inspiring me to rewatch it. But, it's uh, super sad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. it's not Can't a fun it's not a, yeah, it's like <laughs> yeah no yeah <laughs> right um in terms of your influences in improv and whether that's outside because you already talked about like kurosawa and, and some film influences but improv influences obviously you've spent a lot of time uh immersed in keith johnstone stuff yeah um but others and also other theater people or other sources that you found kind of have created the fabric of, of what you tend to sort of put forward? Well, uh, it's impossible uh, not to be influenced by Viola Spolin. It's mm -hmm. impossible not to be influenced by, uh, um, what's his name? Um, you worked with him a lot. Del Close. Del, Del Close. Oh, mm -hmm. Sorry about that. Uh, it's impossible not to be influenced by Dudley Riggs from um, Minnesota, who just passed away recently. Right. However, he doesn't get a lot of enough credit for that stuff because I don't know why, probably because he didn't have a book for the longest time. Uh, it's impossible not to be influenced by, uh, for God's sakes, Moliere, or uh, uh, it's impossible not to have that sort of, in, uh, that sort of influence. Uh, I think probably the things that influence me the most are uh well for instance you and josh conescu and uh uh david silverman uh and matt smith uh were all huge influence rebecca stockley uh huge influence uh and the and the thing is that is that you synthesize those ideas in yourself and you're looking to find you're looking to see what it is that's uh, the theater does that you that inspired you to get into it in the first place and you know for me you know it's one of those things where i one of my uh i i after after high school i had kind of thought well that was fun doing uh, doing theater in high school fantastic i'm not, i'm done with that because it's not a viable profession and i wound up uh doing uh man of la mancha in a in an opera house in of all places chico california and uh, the thing that got me every night was at the end where, spoiler alert, Don Quixote dies. Uh, <laughs> every night he would die and there would be this collective groan from the audience, this animalistic sort of, oh, from, from the audience. And you could see a significant portion of the audience, because I'm not talking for the, the end of the play. Right. But you could see all these people in the audience with tears streaming down your face and you're going, how does this work? How do you get that happening? What is it that makes people go through this thing? They, they know what the story is. They know this thing. Why? And, and how can you affect people in that way? And, you know, of course, uh, for me personally, I always love making people laugh. You know, uh, I, the, amount, the amount of uh, gyrations I would go through to get to watch Monty Python on the public television station from San Francisco when I was in the middle of the Central Valley. You know, I had to rig up antennas to watch the damn thing on Sunday nights at 11, you know? So the amount of stuff I would go through to get an interesting laugh where you get to see people doing interesting things that make you laugh and affect you in a weird way, staying up late to watch uh, Saturday Night Live or, or uh, Steve Martin on, uh, on Johnny Carson, you know, that kind of stuff. It, it, you wonder why that happens, so. Right. Um, and do you think, and this is uh, probably too mature improvisers talking, um, can, you know, so you're talking about rigging up things to watch Monty Python, and, and again, that idea of really seeking it out. Um, and is it just that somehow there, it, that still exists, we're just not up to speed on it? Because there, yeah. I, obviously there are new influences. Uh, but, you know, because the sense I get a lot with students is they just want you to, to, you know, tell them the three things they need to know, and then that's it. They don't want to actually go find these things and then figure out how to stay up late at night to watch it so that you don't, you know, miss out on it. So, um, so what do you think? That's a good you, one. Are we missing it? Are we missing that's, the boat somewhere? That's a really good question. I, uh, I, 
I don't necessarily think we're missing the boat per se. I, I, we are miss certainly missing the boat because we're old and we don't understand what's interesting about TikTok. We don't get that, you know, <laughs> it's fine. Uh, the question I think, uh, or not the question is that we, uh, because of our, probably because of our maturity, uh, we are looking for ways of going beyond just the basic, uh, getting people to laugh or any of that sort of thing. Because anybody on some level can improvise. Anybody can improvise. Anybody can do a passable improv scene that makes people laugh and is enjoyable and is fun to do. Anybody can do it. But if you're going to do it for, uh, if you're going to do it, do it, you're going to have to find something more inside of it. And if you're the way that you find something more is you relate to all the other story tendril kind of things. How do you make a, an improv company last? You find ways of telling stories and doing things that will last beyond just the joke. Right. Right. Nothing wrong with jokes. I love a good joke. One of my favorite ones on stage with you and me was, <laughs> we're not viruses, we're semen. So <laughs> I, I don't know if you remember that, but I will never effing <laughs> forget that one. So, yeah. wow, yeah. really you back to time. That's, uh, you remember? Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> or I should say, it's all come back. I, I yeah. don't I haven't spent a lot of time thinking about it, but oh yeah, wow, it comes reeling back. That's <laughs> yeah. I thought I thought the roof was going to come off uh, the 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 the, uh, the the market theater when that that happened. Yeah, we were really. and we tried to go on after the joke. It was just too, it was too much mayhem after that. Yeah, so. and in that moment, um, is a great example of that thing that I think we try to talk about and teach, which is, you know, play the moment where it is. Don't try to create the moment, or don't huh? try to milk the moment, or don't try to, you know, set it up or recreate it or do whatever. I mean, it was just a product of that moment, and it was like, in a way, uh, perhaps. Uh, giving us maybe more credit, but in, in a way, example of sort of like perfect timing for the perfect offer in that moment. And that doesn't happen that often, no. but it's what you're striving for pretty much all the time. Right. Um, and that idea of making more out of it, I think is really interesting because as you were talking about that, I was thinking about something that Del, Del Close used to talk about, which was, you know, he said, and, and we would talk about, you know, auditioning improvisers and what are you looking for and things like that. And, um, and he said something that I kind of reflected on for a long time and then kind of went, oh, yeah, he's right. Which he said, you know, funny people, funny people are a dime a dozen. You know, you go to an improv audition, you throw a rock, you're going to hit a funny person. What you're looking <laughs> for, right, is, is that person that has that something more. They want to do more than just make people laugh. They want to do more than, you know, uh, get the accolades for their character or whatever it is. They want to somehow affect an audience in a, in a different way. And for us, in terms of you and I and the West Coast tradition, that happens through story. And it can happen through character, it can happen through other stuff. That's all good. Um, but uh, I think that's a really interesting distinction to make. And you know, I, I constantly talk to students, maybe you talk to your students too, um, about you know, one of the big questions you need to always be reflecting on is why am I doing this? Because yeah. if you can't come up with an answer for that, then why are you doing it? <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, and even if the answer is, I want to tell jokes, great, then own that. Just as you said, nothing wrong with it. And yeah. uh, it's really it's really hard when you're teaching this stuff because you you do want to tell them what you think, and you don't want to tell them that this is the only way. And that's kind of uh, oh my god, improv books, improv books. Uh, I love. <laughs> All of those that, of you that I know that have written improv books, I love you. You're great. You say interesting things. <laughs> Most of them try to tell you how to improvise. Yeah. It's just not going to. Well, you know, uh, one of the genius things about, about improv is it doesn't seem like he's trying to teach you how to improvise. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's more about the philosophy behind the yeah. improv rather than giving you a bunch of exercises, although there are exercises in it. But uh, definitely more about the philosophy of it than um, than anything else. Yeah, um, yeah, I, I, I see what you're saying about the books in the sense that uh, I always have problems when people sort of say, "Forget everything else. This is the only thing you need." 
And it's like, no, improv should be about inclusion. You know, so I encourage everybody to take lots of classes, study with other people, read lots of books, find the one that speaks to you and run with that. Um, test, yeah. test the theory. <laughs> find out if I'm right. <laughs> For God's sakes. Right. And, and, oh, I have a little problem with that is that I was, both of my parents were scientists. Right. So at the dinner table, the way you got your point across is you would make a make your argument and you would make it in a way where this is all and, and it's a way of speaking that I, I i struggle with every day as a teacher every day right right so i i want them to know what i think and all that sort of stuff but it's like how do you do this and i start to tell them how to do it it's like hold on a second this is just my opinion <laughs> but right 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 yeah, it's, it's, uh, and those research, I mean, again, I think one of the things that we benefited from in the beginning of UP and when you started doing improv as well was in a way, a lack of resources, but nobody knew, everyone was kind of on an equal level for the most part. There weren't a lot of people, I mean, you had Keith and other teachers, um, Viola Spolin, but, you know, in terms of an improv group, it was kind of the blind leading the blind of like, well, I don't know exactly how to do this. Let's figure it out together. And, and we would sort of stumble through solutions. And as you're saying, you know, test the theory. Um, and sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't, you know. I mean, that's what I found in Spolin was uh, until I started working with Spolin teachers that really I felt got it. Uh, I realized one, I just had a couple of bad Spolin teachers. And two, I didn't know what the hell, you know, because I used to kind of go, oh, this is kind of stupid. Why is this, you know, but once all of a sudden my eyes were open, then all of a sudden it was like, oh, now I get it, yeah. right? And uh, so and but now there's so many resources and books and, you know. Yeah, I, when I first started teaching at the, I teach at the College of Marin, by the way. If you live in Marin County and are interested in an improv class, go to College of Marin. Anyway, so uh, the one of the things at the colleges I used to teach, I used to want to teach a, a, a unit on history of improvisation. And so I, I've been, you know, going through and, you know, going through all the resources I can possibly find mm -hmm. going to going to theater book library. Now the internet is great for that sort of thing. Well, uh, what I realized is up to a point until uh, 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 whose line is it anyway, got broadcast in America, you could sort of tell where things came from. Right. 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 You didn't really, you couldn't really, because you know, people don't remember things and improvisers never write anything down. They're bad at it and bad at their own history. Uh, but, you know, it goes up to whose line is it anyway, which is so was so great for the industry. But everything after that is uh, is just a mishmash because it, it got out there. Everybody saw it and went, I want to do that. I'm going to try that. And then the, they were able to sample from everywhere. And then right about the same time, uh, People had email all of a sudden, and you could, you could, you could go to uh, Christchurch, New Zealand, after seeing people at a tournament, and go on and and see their show and hang out with them and teach workshops and they get and take their workshops and then, you know, but you don't know where that came from and right, you know, all of a sudden it all comes after a certain point. It's pro it's a good thing I'm sure, but seeing the lines of uh, where things come from is useful, at least uh, at least from a teacher's standpoint, because you can you can sort of go, oh, I see why they did this. I see what this is about. I, I understand. Right. right. So, well, you and I should definitely have a talk about a history of improv things. I want to do a history of improv class um, with lots of examples that, you know, because you can do things now. In fact, um, right here. Ooh, uh, nice. And uh, uh, because it's important to know where you came from. And, you know, and these guys, uh, one, are probably a lot smarter than I am. And two, they solved a lot of problems. Um, they did. And so I don't have to, to solve the problems again. Um, and so I've always wanted to teach that class, but I've always been afraid that no one will take it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're the, we're, the, we're the effing improv nerds here. This class is for us. Screw <laughs> them. They don't need to know. So we'll offer the class and the two of us will show up. Yeah. <laughs> and geek out about improv history. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I've, I, every time I prepare for my semester, I go out and I try to find new stuff and I go, 
what the hell? What is this? Oh my God, why didn't I know about this? Yeah. You know, yeah. there's like there's a there's an entire uh uh Arabic uh tradition of improvisation theater kind of things that had this clowning element that's very much like uh commedia dell'arte that was very uh community based for uh for weddings and that that sort of thing where they would have like these plays that were mostly improvised comedies right and it's a whole tradition thing yeah and it seems like each culture has its version of that and so and what could we learn from them the other cultures but also earlier in our traditions um you know and that way we're not reinventing the wheel we're not having to solve it and you know but it takes the time and, and you know to find that stuff and then to listen to it and to do uh, or watch it read it um whatever it is but yeah we should definitely chat i'd love to hear what your thoughts are on what you would cover and who you would cover in your history well, of improv class because i have uh, lots of notes so we can do it well, one of my the- one of my theories that i've had forever is uh, my guess is the first theater was probably improvised comedy right you know it's probably sitting around the campfire going uh, remember what fact did when he slipped in <laughs> uh, in the in the mastodon dung <laughs> do it again you do such a good fact <laughs> go on show us that right yeah i like the idea of the first improviser being named fag <laughs> <laughs> that's that's my nod to the far side by the way so right, right, right. thank you gary uh, larson yeah no it works so yeah. uh so we're a little bit over but i do want to ask one last question uh just because i'm curious again uh, from all your decades of improv experience where are you at currently um as an improviser is your preference to teach to direct to perform um to you know be responsible to totally lay back and let other people just run it and i just show up um where are you at today after all this experience well uh the pro the problem with that question at least for me is that uh there's a pandemic going on so the so the performing angle of things uh is Mm -hmm. hasn't been around for more Mm -hmm. than a year and uh, I mean, no, you can perform and everything, but I'm a creature of the stage and not a creature of film and that's fine. Uh, so I don't know where I am. I have, if, honestly, for the first time in years, I actually have an idea for a show I wanna do, which wow. is fantastic, yeah. Uh, I don't know if it's gonna come to anything because I don't know how to communicate it right. I'm, I'm talking to people who know better, so. Uh, anyway, so here's the thing. I kind of I uh, every the last time I did uh, theater sports, I had such a great time, such a great time. It was unbelievable. Nonsense was coming out of us, and you know the audience was doing exactly what great theater sports audiences do, which is uh, have huge, like thunderous thumps of laughter, not the sort of spread out things that grow just these big woofs. Mm-hmm fantastic and you know uh people talking to me after uh it, it, weeks later going you know what this was about me going really well thank you uh so that performing thing happened just bit like in february of tw- uh 2020 and it was like wow i love this i love theater sports i love uh short form improvisation where you focus on story i just love it mm-hmm. i don't know if i can do it anymore I just don't, you know, physically I don't. Uh, uh, I've had to teach uh, uh, online, which I'm not good at. I'm just, it's a, it's a weird thing. I can't read the, I can't read the students. And yet uh, in March of last year, while I was teaching uh, uh, my class at College of Marin, I had a, a bunch of, uh, a bunch of, uh, you know, 20 year old college students and they got stuff, they got to it. And I saw stuff I'd never seen before. And I more than one time in the, in the, in the months before, uh, before this semester, uh, but got sent online, I came, I came up from my class and went in my office and I was just vibrating. And 
uh, the head of our department was directing one of the play. She, and I'm like, in my in my office, and she pops her head in. I go, I just love teaching. I just love it because <laughs> you know they inspired the hell out of me. You know, watching these people get it and try things and accept each other and uh, let go of their own ideas and see everyone in a scene let go of their ideas and take the step through that open doorway where they right. don't know what they're doing and 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 they go piling into this unknown future and and it just, the scene kind of goes blam and crashes and doesn't end properly but it's so thrilling right. so i don't know what to say about that i right. i I'm, I'm thrilled about teaching and and being on stage but i i can probably still teach live but i don't know about performing live and that's a, really just a physical thing right because right. I, I do, I do recognize that the last time I uh, I did a show, uh, it was on a Friday and Saturday. I was uh, I had to get in the shower very early and put a hot pad on and <laughs> put my feet up because you know my muscles were sore because I I can't stop myself from being an idiot. I just can't. Right. <laughs> I'm gonna do a pratfall. I am just gonna do a pratfall. I, I'm going to try to pick someone up over my head and I'm all juiced <laughs> with adrenaline. I'm going to pick somebody who's, you know, two, a 200 pound person over my head. And then I'm going to get off stage and not be able to turn my head to the left. <laughs> I'm an idiot. I understand. How, how, how does Bill Irwin do it? I just don't understand how Bill Irwin, because yeah, Bill Irwin is kind of a, a current hero of mine. I just mm -hmm. don't know how he, gets all that i mean maybe he has a hot tub or something because uh, yeah or a masseuse backstage that yeah 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 no you're right that's, that's where i am so okay yeah. cool well uh i hope you continue performing even if it's not all the time i'm uh, a whore of course i'm gonna do it <laughs> of course i'm gonna do it uh as well as teach uh cool paul well thank you so much for being here and doing this and doing it again because i have all, i have all these notes here of stuff that if i needed something to talk about didn't get to one of them <laughs> oh, oh except for I, except for dudley riggs dudley riggs, dudley riggs. Right. yeah yeah well and actually to, to close out i mean and touch upon the thing that you said about where we've come from because you know obviously in the last few years of people like dudley riggs uh and everybody basic you know keith continues on but most of them are dying and it's like, you know, and at some point it's a finite resource. So Dudley Riggs, whatever Dudley Riggs left out there, you know, obviously it continues on in the teachers and the students who carry for, forward his work, for instance. But, uh, but at some point you kind of, that's it. You know, this is all, this is all that person developed. This is all that person did. And there's no more new ideas, no more new things coming from that person. And, and I think, you know, improv being such a new art form, especially the way it's developed in North America, where it doesn't really go back to the commedia tradition um, initially. So it goes back to like the 20s and 30s, you know, all of that generation of masters who've kind of figured out a lot of this stuff are going by the wayside um, and, uh, you know, part of progress. And then, but it's like, we should really take advantage of those resources while they're here. Um, yeah, I, I can't uh, figure out how long Keith is going to keep going on. Uh, right. I was the last, uh, I saw him like four years ago and I was really super worried about him because, because uh, he, he taught a workshop and he had trouble staying on track. And uh, then he figured something out, which was he told his, he started telling his uh, students, if I repeat myself, please tell me. If I go off track, please tell me. Right. And so he gives us permission to say, uh, Keith, you just said that. Right. And he was sharp as a goddamn razor. And right. so yeah. I'm hoping he, I am hoping that after a year of isolation, he still likes doing it. And I recommend everybody go to Calgary and try to take a workshop from him if you have the opportunity. Because yeah, is, anywhere. Yeah. He Please. is a treasure. And you know, there are like Patty Styles and you and Rebecca Stockley and uh, I'm sure, that, and or Teresa Robbins Dudek, and right. you know uh, Patricia Ryan Madsen. That they, they all, they all embody a lot of the things that are, are great about Keith Johnstone. And uh, but Keith is also a very 
very, very, very singular creature. You know? Right. Yeah. So. No. Yeah. It's it's definitely um, get him while you can. <laughs> yeah. Because certainly we can't go back and get Viola Spolin, and we can't get Dudley Riggs anymore, and we right. can't get Del Close anymore. You know. The, right yeah well and that's a, a thing i had with dell actually because he would say you know anytime i had a chance to watch dell teach i would watch him teach and after yeah. a while he's like i don't understand why you're wasting all your time coming you know you already know all this and blah 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 and i said well because i want to get it from the horse's mouth because and i'm right one day the horse won't be there <laughs> yeah and yeah. and you know we 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 glean things out of out of a class on right. in April, and then we glean something else in a class in July. That th right. when they say the same exact things. Right. I, I remember specifically one. I was taking. Uh, I was sitting in the back of a class that Keith was teaching uh, down the aisle from William Hall, another fine improv teacher yeah. uh, from William Hall, and we're sitting up there, and Keith said something, and I went, "Oh, oh my God!" And I went that that i'm looking over at william going like that and he's like looking at him, what the fuck are you talking about and i scooted across the room. i go what he just said and he goes it's an impro paul it's an <laughs> impro and then and he goes and the next day he comes back with a copy of impro with a bookmark in exactly the same thing and so i've read this since i was in college right right and yet it just didn't get past this and into into the actual brainstem. So yeah. yeah. Cool. Well, what a pleasure talking to you. It's good catching up. And uh, again, like I said, for redoing it. Um, and uh, next week uh, on this show, on this show, um, <laughs> we'll have uh, Kaiser Coco Palmer from Helsinki, who will be here. Um, talking about uh, teaching and how, her approach to improv and some of that northern european stuff um so look for that again we have shows wednesday at the theater duos at seven o'clock friday and saturdays 8 30 we're doing theater sports live uh, at the theater there it is um and then sunday we have an open improv show at seven o'clock as well and then tonight at seven o'clock on our Twitch channel, we have an exclusive online show that we're doing called UPTV. Um, and we'll be doing more sort of exclusively online shows. Uh, so pay attention to that. So find out about our classes. If you wanna make a donation, find out about the shows, uh, go to unexpectedproductions.org. And uh, once again, thank you, Paul Kellum. Thank you for having me, Randy. And if we missed out on any of the questions from the folks uh, on Facebook Live, sorry. Yeah, well, no, there weren't a lot of comments, I think because of my amazing ability as an interviewer to somehow not bring up anything that you wanted to talk about. <laughs> so that's my one goal every week. I want to talk about nothing, nothing that they want to talk about. Uh, well, you know, the real big problem with me is uh, so you say, so tell me about you. Oh, I don't want to talk about myself. <laughs> and I'm going to talk about myself. So anyway. All right. Take care. And you, hopefully we'll see you guys somewhere live at the theater or online. <laughs>